Ellen, thank you, and thank you to the staff who've worked incredibly hard to make tonight a very special evening for all of you. Thank you, Ellen. Before I begin my, my remarks, those of you who have uh, been with me before at public events will not be surprised. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the most important people who are not here and can't be with us. As the chaplain mentioned tonight in dangerous places around the world, men and women serve in uniform and in our intelligence and security services on our behalf so that we might be here safe and secure and enjoy our freedoms. And then there are others who have been wounded on the fields of battle tonight who tend their wounds with their loved ones. And lastly, there are those who have paid the ultimate price and, and have been laid to rest on the nation's behalf and their families grieve for them. And so tonight, before I begin, I would like to take a moment and thank those who serve on our behalf in those places around the world and those families who sacrifice. Thank you for what you do for this nation. Well, it was just a year ago, and I was at a dinner, a, a black tie dinner in New York at the Intrepid, where Secretary Gates was being honored. And I sat at the table and listened to General Scowcroft give a very eloquent introduction of the Secretary, and I thought to myself, note to self, do not follow General Scowcroft, because you could never do it as well as he could. I'm in trouble, sir. Help me here, will you? Um, here we are a year later. And I had to consider where to start, how, where, where to begin. And you know, you cannot help but be struck by the enormity of the Secretary's task. We are obviously, in addition to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we, we face proliferation challenges around the world in North Korea and Iran. There are serious threats from places like Yemen and Somalia, and there's pirates, and oh my goodness, you cannot help but be taken back to the words of that wonderful patriot, Thomas Paine. In, in the early 1790s, he wrote in, in a, a piece called The Crisis, it, it meant to inspire General George Washington's troops who, had, who were floundering the, in the War of Independence, these immortal words, quote, these are the time that try men's souls. And boy, we are in such a time, and so it is understandable to me that eight presidents have turned to Secretary Bob Gates uh, for his wisdom and his counsel. And not only do they have that in common, but Secretary Gates is the only Secretary of Defense to have been asked by a newly elected president to remain in service. And so we ought to ask ourselves, why would that be? Yes. He is of brilliant intellect and hardworking and committed to the nation and all those things. But my children, I have, uh, I was just saying to somebody, my kids are getting older. My youngest is nine and my, ki my kid will always say, well, but what mom is the magic sauce? What's that, what's the thing that makes it special? And, and I thought long and hard about how I would describe that, I have had the great privilege of having served with Bob Gates when I was in the Bush administration. And so I wanted to spend time trying to describe for you what I think that is. We know uh, that Secretary Gates has had a distinguished and long public service career, having spent 27 years as an intelligence professional. And so this is someone who, without doubt, long before he came to the Department of Defense, believed and committed a substantial portion of his life and his family's lives to public service. And what does that mean? I mean, I think to most people, when we think about public service, we think of three things. Um, certainly, a commitment to our nation and to the people of the United States. We think about a commitment to mission. And those of us in Washington uh, understand service in an administration. 
And in fact, uh, you, when you serve in an administration in a political position, your swearing certificate reminds you that you serve at the pleasure of the president. Now, I, I've been cautioned to please resist any reference to the current pleasures of the president and those who serve him, and so I'm gonna skip any reference to that now. But, so you've got service to country, service to mission, and service in an administration, if that is where you serve. But having had the privilege to, to serve with Bob Gates, we were talking at dinner and I thought, hmm, I wonder if he's read my remarks, because I don't think those three really capture for you the commitment to public service of both Bob and Becky Gates. It, because clearly to me, there is to them the most important part of service, and that is service to those whom you lead or command. They share that very basic belief of service to those that they serve with, they serve for, that they lead and that they command. And they do that every single day with grace, humility, and a quiet courage. And most of all, as I said earlier to him, tenacity. And they serve together. Sec whether it's Secretary Gates' commitment to the medical needs and capabilities that serve our men and women in uniform, or it's Becky taking, special t taking time to support military wives and their families in addition to her own, Bob and Becky Gates understand that service isn't something that just is out or up, but it is most importantly to those you serve with and serve for. There's a, you will not be surprised to hear me ask forgiveness. I'm gonna use a little bit of a crass military term, and that is, you know, people are, people uh, as they rise up the ranks are often accused of the kiss up and piss down theory, and I couldn't help but laugh Secretary and I were having a conversation over dinner that I promised I would not repeat. Um, but it, he strikes me much more if, if there's kissing, it's going down, and if there's anything else going on, it's going up. It's not, <laughs> <laughs> he sort of turned that phrase. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick, a, two quick Bob Gates stories. Um, he doesn't know what I'm gonna say. Uh, my first interaction with the secretary after his swearing in, I was the President's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor with a little office in the basement of the West Wing. Uh, and we had obviously, even back then in 2006, been talking about, with the President, about Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I had some concerns based on things that were being said to me about the working relationship between DOD and the CIA. It was good, but it could be better. And there were concerns and things that I thought we needed to take a look at. And of course, uh, the secretary was just, had just been sworn in and the president said, talk to Gates. He knows both communities. Have a conversation with him. And so, secretary was coming over for a principal's meeting. I asked his staff if he could stop early uh, in my office. And I, I, we had this conversation. And it, it's probably too much, sir, to call it a conversation. He came in and he sat down very politely. I'd say he said two words, um, but probably that's an exaggeration. I did most of the talking, explained what I thought the issues would be, was anxious to work with him, was happy to run a policy process, you know, read meetings in the West Wing, um, and I looked forward to talking to him. The two words he said were thank you, he got up and walked out of my office, and I, I, <laughs> I can remember, <laughs> I can remember saying to the president, said, so how'd that go with Gates, and I said, I'm, I don't think it went very well. I mean, I, I can't really tell. He said, why? And I said, he only said two words, thank you, as he was leaving. Now, the, the postscript to that story is, um, he never called me about it. He never came back in and discussed it. I ran no policy process. And that's the good news. Because Secretary Gates didn't need the White House, needed no more meetings, that's for sure. Um, he worked with the director of the CIA. They addressed the problem completely on their own, as it should have been, and the problem was solved, and that's Bob Gates. Um, my, other, my, other great, my other telling story about Bob Gates is I can remember sitting in the Situation Room, again, discussing a uh, foreign policy issue, uh, and there's lots of big egos and lots of people cabinet, at the cabinet level talking about what their view was, and Bob Gates was being very quiet. And I remember thinking, boy, that's dangerous. We need, uh, Steve needs to ask the secretary what he thinks. And the secretary has this wonderful way. Um, I call it a headshot. 
But let me describe it for you because he, the Secretary was asked what he thought and he very patiently and quietly sort of described what his position was and he stopped and he sat back and he has this little smile where the corners of his mouth turn up. And I said to Steve Hadley, you got to watch for that because that's the headshot. Somebody at this table has just been shot in the head. We just haven't heard them hit the floor yet. <laughs> um, you know, it's when we think of uh, when we think of heroes when we're children, you know, I look at my sons now, and we think of heroes as being these supersized, iconic people. We think of peacemakers like Gandhi or Martin Luther King. We think of scientists and astronauts and saints like Mother Teresa. They are these larger than life figures. They seem unattainable, they're outliers, to use Malcolm Gladwell's term. But as we acquire the wisdom of age, we realize that there is a smaller but no less potent size hero. Maybe it's the teacher who stays late with a student struggling because a parent is serving overseas and is deployed. Or the police, policeman or plumber who enlisted in the military after 9-11 or serves in the National Guard. Or perhaps it's the neighbor who takes your children overnight because a member of the uniform military service is home on leave. These are the smaller neighbor size heroes. There are many in this room tonight. The smaller size, you don't know their names, but they remind us of our own potential, our ability to be those neighbor size heroes. I have no doubt that Bob and Becky Gates are nervous about where I'm going with this story. Um, because I'm quite certain that Bob and Becky Gates do not regard themselves as heroes. But of course, heroes never do. They have lived lives of service to others and to their country. They have walked that path and led the way with humility, grace, and quiet courage from the neighborly size heroes to being iconic national heroes but most especially not only to the men and women in this room, but to the men and women who wear the uniform and fight for us tonight.